Founders' Search for the Ideal Society. And we're, we've been discussing the great uh, principles that were given to Moses from Mount Sinai that the Founding Fathers thought had such tremendous significance in good government. And I wanted to, uh, you're uh, up to number five on your outline. And the entire code of justice that was given to Moses was quite different than our own. Justice was based on reparation to the victim rather than fines and punishment by the commonwealth. Well, what does that mean? It simply means that when a person has been injured or his property has been injured, the damages go to the person who's been injured and not fines to the government. I like that. That is real justice for all. Uh, much, much better than our present system, I have to confess. For example, if somebody steals a sheep, he not only has to return the sheep, but another sheep besides, or the value of two sheep. Unless it's for commercial purposes, then he has to return four. And if it's cattle, or that is cows and so forth, it's five. It gets bigger. See, it just takes all the profit out of organized crime. <laughs> Not a great system? No, I tell you, it's much better than the one that we are practicing now. And, and some of our states are beginning to adopt it. The state of Utah uh, did so just last year, where judges are now allowed to include as part of the sentence the insistence that the individual repair the damages to his victim. Isn't that interesting? All right, now that's the way that thing is going. All right, now, uh, an accused, uh, leaders were elected. Excuse me, let me just see here. Did I get ahead of it? Uh, all right. Number six, leaders are elected and new laws are approved by the common consent of the people. Not by some ruler saying uh, uh, that you have to be subject to this and that. No. Uh, by the consent of the people. And number seven, person is innocent until proven guilty. Innocent. And if you can't absolutely prove him guilty, if you're highly suspicious but you can't get a jury to quite convict him, somebody holds out and believes there's a reasonable doubt, the founder said, that's all right, leave it to God. Leave it to God. Nobody gets away with anything in the end, you know. There's a judgment. All right, uh, now uh, I just want to go uh, across the history of the Israelites very quickly so you'll see what, what happened to them. Um, the Israelites finally got up into Palestine, as you know, or the land of Israel today. Now let me see here if I can just identify this for you. You see here's Mediterranean up along here. Now as they came over the Jordan River, they crossed over the Jordan River, they occupied all of this territory. But in 922 about, they divided with two tribes here, ten tribes up here. You remember that? All right. Now that was the situation. They were divided like that for a couple hundred years. And then these people that were up in Assyria, coming down out of Nineveh, came down here and they, they captured these ten tribes and carried them back up here for, well, to 605 B.C. And then those ten tribes escaped. And the reason they did was because Assyria was all uh, conquered here by the Babylonians that were further south. And that allowed the ten tribes to go up here over the Caucasus Mountains and settle all around the Black Sea there. Right? They, just, they just went right over those Caucasus Mountains. And, and there by the Black Sea they, they disappeared. They became known as the Lost Tribes. The Lost Tribes, way back about five or 600 B.C. All right, now... Uh, we're going to take a look at the Anglo-Saxons, and their story begins right where the Lost Tribes end off, ended off. Now, that may have some historical significance, because you see the Anglo-Saxons came from right around here. Now, that's where the, where the Lost Tribes disappeared. And then they came right across Europe, and they came right over here, and they finally settled uh, in this little spot right in here. And uh, we'll take a close-up here, you see. Uh, they, they settled in what we call Jutland of Denmark. And uh, they, they changed, they started out with their name Yinglings. You want to spell that? Y-N-G-L-I-N-G-S. Yinglings. Or if you're Danish, Yinglings. All right? That was their names. Now, when they got up here, they changed a little bit to Engels and Anglos, right? It was originally Yinglings. And um, they came up about uh, 65 B.C., that's number two, and... Uh, came up from the Black Sea, and they settled all around here. Well, having changed their name, they began populating all this part of Europe, and, uh, and then eventually got into England. Now, number three, um, let's see, you have one more blank under two, don't you? You see, after they conquered the Saxi, who were part of the Scythian people, they became known as the Anglo-Saxons. Then about 450, they started coming into England, about 450 A.D. Now, by that time, 
the British had, the people that were there were Celts, and the Romans had left, and it was the Celts themselves that invited, they were called Celts or Britons, they invited these blonde uh, people from across the sea to come over and help them in some of their fighting among themselves, and that's how they first happened to come in. And Hengist and Horsa were the names of the two men who came in first. Hengist and Horsa. Now, that's not in the books lately. And um, they were successful, finally, in uh, amalgamating with all the Anglo-Saxons up in, up in northern Europe. And they became known as the Vikings. And uh, they just traveled uh, all over the territory. And you, you probably remember how uh, they started out from Norway. They came down to Iceland. And the Irish had conquered that, so they chased the Irish out. Then they discovered Greenland. And in due time, they came down, and as you know, they, they came over and, and discovered America 500 years before Columbus. All right. Now, they died out for some reason. Uh, they were good settlers, actually. Uh, they were very rugged people. Boy, when they came in, they brought their cows and they brought their horses. Uh, they were a very rugged people. And uh, they, they made good settlers, good pioneers. But it would seem that eventually they were either killed off by the Indians or by disease. We're not quite sure exactly what happened to them. But we've been digging up the ruins, you see, uh, of the, uh, that, that exist up there, and uh, can, we can find out where they, where they stayed. But long before Columbus arrived here, they were gone. All right, did you get all of your blanks there? Now, I just wanted to remind you that these Anglo-Saxons, when they came over, had institutes identical with that of ancient Israel. Um, First of all, they considered themselves freemen, remember, just like the Israelites, proclaim liberty to all the land. These people took great pride in being freemen and staying free, all right? And uh, then they were organized exactly like ancient Israel. A person in charge of ten families was called a tithing man, tithing man. He didn't go around collecting tithing, he was the tenth man, that's what it meant. And then they had someone that was called either a vill man or a toon man, and that was probably the head of the village of um, something like 50 families. And, um, and then uh, they got to the point where they had 100 families together, and they called the territory 100, and they called the man in charge of that area a hundred man. Isn't that interesting? He was a hundred man. Now, if you have a thousand families, they call that a shire, that's a shire. A thousand families would be located here. And the administrative officer was called an earl. A actually, elder man, and if they reduced it to earl. You've heard of barons and earls. All right, now it was earl in charge of a shire of around a thousand families. And his assistant was called the shire reef, and we pronounce it sheriff. You see, our whole tradition is Anglo-Saxon. And they, in turn, had the identical institutes with ancient Israel. All right, now as we look at the Anglo-Saxons, we find that they had, did you get that for number, um, number four was sheriff, earl and sheriff. All right, now let's go to capital, or to little c here. All laws had to be by the common consent of the people, just like Israel. See, Israel used to turn down some of the kings and some of, you remember that? All right, so do these people. And authority granted to a chieftain was limited, just like ancient Israel. And they had a whole code of laws where the damages went to the victim, and that's E. D is limited, and E is victim. Now, you see, under that system, if damage is done to a person or to his property, um, then, then you have to have that person indemnified. What about crimes? What is a crime, anyway? That's an offense against the whole people. You see, we count a robbery or a burglary a crime. It isn't. It's an offense against somebody, isn't it? And instead of having the fines go to the government, we ought to be having the damages go to the person who was robbed or who was burglarized. All right. They only had four crimes, and here they are. One, treason. Treason. Two, cowardice. Either by refusing to fight or failing to fight courageously. Cowardice. And three was desertion in time of great distress and war, desertion. And four was homosexuality, considered a crime against the whole people. And the death penalty applied to all four of these offenses. They were all considered very serious. All right? All of these offenses against the whole people were punishable by death, 
Note that all other offenses were considered to be against the person or property of an individual, and he was reimbursed. All right. It was the intent of the founders, especially Jefferson, to restore the Anglo-Saxon institutes based on that of ancient Israel. And I've given you a quotation from one of the famous authorities on Jefferson's life to, to illustrate how strongly he felt about the necessity for Americans getting back to those great fundamentals of Anglo-Saxon law that were related and identical with that of ancient Israel. All right. Now, if you will go over to uh, Capital D. All right. D on your outline. Okay. All right. The early founders also wanted to maintain a close identification between the ancient Israelites and the Anglo-Saxons. And so guess what? When they wanted to set up a seal, the first seal was going to show Hengist and Horsa, the first men to use, you see we have them here? Hengist and Horsa, the first men to bring Anglo-Saxon law into England. And then guess what they wanted over here on the other side? Now they went over here, Israel going through the wilderness led by God's pillar of fire. Now that's what they wanted the first seal to be. Uh, and that's your blank. The first seal was going to be that. And that's to let you know that in capital E, you see, they, they got their ideas from these two great people. And they wanted to identify that on the seal. Did you get those two blank, idea and seal? And um, uh, let's see. Uh, did, you, did you get Jefferson on D? All right. Um, that was Jefferson's great ideas that I was telling you about. And of course, he was on the committee. Jefferson was on the committee with John Adams and Franklin. And so they wanted this seal to be like uh, the one that I just showed. But it was a little complicated to put on a two-inch medallion. So they, we ended up with a simpler seal, which is on the back of the dollar bill. All right, Roman numeral four. The founders next had to decide whether the framework of government should be a democracy or a republic. What about that? You want a democracy or a republic? Well, what was the most famous democracy? It was Pericles of Athens. And that, uh, that individual did a rather remarkable job. In a very short period of years, he turned the people free, which democracy permitted, and thought that that would be a great a asset. And so that's your first blank, freedom. And it allowed them to do nearly everything that was done on the great mountain that uh, overlooks Athens, and I take tours every once in a while, and practically everything now that is, that is on the Acropolis uh, was, was done by Pericles during this uh, particular period. And the Parthenon, all those beautiful buildings were built during a period of about 40 years, which is the golden age of Greece. All right, now, it worked great as far as freedom was concerned. How about uh, politics? How about the governing of the people? It was terrible. It didn't work at all. They found that democracy was uh, terribly cumbersome. So number one, uh, it was too cumbersome. In Athens, 6,000 required to pass a law. 6,000. And 201 to 2,001 to serve on a jury. Now, number two, the people grew weary. They grew weary of participating. They'd rather let George do it. <laughs> and three, Pericles found that democracy was very bad in time of an emergency, such as a war. You couldn't get the people together to get a, uh, an agreement on what they should do. And so number four, they also voted to soak the rich and um, use their democratic power uh, to destroy the equal rights that should exist among the people. If you got a little extra, your property wasn't as, wasn't as sacred as other people's, they would vote to take it away from you. And so uh, the protection of rights was damaged. That's number four. All right, capital B. Uh, the founders also carefully studied the efforts of the Romans to set up a republic. Now Rome, a, a city of a million people, governing 60 million people, um, it started out as a monarchy, then they took it over into a republic, but it had a problem. Uh, it was governed by its Senate, and the Senate was elected only by the wealthy landowners. That's number one, the wealthy landowners. And even when the masses called the plebeians were able to get an assembly, it was still under the domination of the Senate, and that's number two. So in 30 BC, the republic collapsed, and as all of you know, Augustus Caesar took over as the first emperor of Rome. And from now on, you see they had uh, nearly 300, and, well, nearly 500 years of, of emperorship with the people under the thumb of ruler's law. All right. Now the next ones. Now the founders wanted to have the freedom 
of a democracy and the efficiency of a republic. They figured that if you did it right, a republic really could be made to work. And uh, they were a little concerned that um, it hadn't worked for these other two countries, but they thought they could do it. So they set it up so that our Congress and our elected officials are elected democratically by all the people, right? And then the investigation of problems and the decision making is by our representatives. So what have you got? A democratic republic. And uh, that's what they called it. Um, the number one is elect, use all of the people, all the qualified electors to elect, and then let the representatives who've been elected do the studying and the investigating, because you don't have time, do you? Neither did I, do I. Uh, so that's their job, to go back there full time, find out what's going on, right? All right, and then number three, republic. A democratic republic, and Jefferson, when he set up his party, that's what he called it, a democratic republic. All right? Now, Roman numeral, the next Roman numeral here. Once freedom is established in a commonwealth under people's law, how can it best be preserved? And they said, by keeping power separated. You've got to have your political and economic power dispersed among the people and keep it spread out among the people. Don't let it concentrate. All right, capital B, it should be separated vertically and horizontally. Vertically and horizontally. You see, they studied Polybius, John Locke, Baron Charles de Montesquieu, and all of them said, somehow you've got to work it out so that you can separate power vertically and then horizontally. How do you like that? Now, we very seldom talk about this in political science classes anymore, and that's the genius of the American system. All right, let me talk about the vertical separation of powers first. Now, <clears throat> if, you'll, if you'll notice here, the Founding Fathers, uh, they looked upon the family here as uh, the very foundation, the very foundation. And uh, then they, they would, that's your number one, foundation. Family is the foundation. If you haven't got a strong family, you won't have a strong community. Amen. And so that's the, the, the strength of the family is extremely important right now. And then number two, the community should handle problems uh, for a group of families, you see. Um, what if you had to uh, keep, keep the road in repair? It's a lot better to have the, the whole community handle that, etc. And then the county handles groups of communities. And then the state handles all the problems involving the whole region or all the counties. And that's how logical it is, all right? Now, the federal government on top, of course, up above the state, handles those things which the individual states aren't able to handle, like war, foreign relations, that sort of thing. And so that's states for number five. Now, the horizontal separation of powers is interesting because we go down here to the, um, to the family and... Um, the family here should have a family council. You shouldn't have a dictator father. You should have the mother and the father counseling. You should counsel with the children. There should be a fine, warm relationship. The father's chairman, like the New Testament says, he's first among equals with his wife. That's just to have order. Uh, but he's not to be a dictator and to counsel together. And then when the decision is made, the whole family should support it. All right, number two. Uh, there, the... Um, Separation of powers uh, uh, up to the, the uh, township level or the community level uh, is one which is separated into a mayor and a city council and the courts. A mayor as executive and then the city council and then the courts. And um, then the county ha has a simpler arrangement because the, the county commissioners usually uh, do both they do both the law making and the administering. That's unusual, both. And number four, the separation of power on the state level is a classical uh, arrangement that the founders devised of a three-headed eagle. You notice that three-headed eagle up there at the top of the state? All right, that's the governor for the executive and then the legislature in the center and then the courts on the side interpreting the law. All right, now there's a check at each one of these levels. You see, see that family has the, that check there. That, that line represents the check. And a family has the responsibility. There's mother and father have the responsibility and therefore the right to raise their children to be responsible citizens without interference from the community and up here and up here or the federal government. Unless that uh, the children are being abused to a criminal extent or the home is being used for criminal purposes. 
Uh, so uh, the checks uh, that were set in there are important. Now, under Roman, the next Roman numeral, the whole machinery for checks and balances is to provide a peaceful, a peaceful solution to abuses, so that there's a way to protect us in the family, etc. And um, these checks are, constitute legal machinery at every level to exclude higher, uh, what should we say, authorities from intervening. And so number one, you have the right of the parents to uh, handle their problems, and you get up into the higher level. And the community is supposed to be protected from interference from the, from the county. They handle the local problems without interference. That's number two. And the county is protected from state interference. That's all part of our system. And if you find this breaking down, our checks, of, our checks and balances are breaking down, and freedom and efficiency is being lost. Now, the state is a sovereign political entity. Four is political. A sovereign political entity, and it should be allowed to operate its affairs without interference from the federal government. And that's really disappearing. And number five, the federal government is the supreme law of the land. The supreme law of the land. And that's law that must apply to all of the states. You see how logical all of that is? Uh, so it's just exactly like ancient Israel in its original structure. But I guess we all have to confess we've kind of gotten away from a lot of it. All right, the next Roman numeral. The efforts of the founders to preserve people's law on the federal level is extremely interesting. All right, um, for example, when they first uh, were, became established, the problem was to get away from King George and get over to uh, the side of the spectrum or the place on the spectrum where they could have people's law. And as soon as the states declared their, their independence in 1776, they tried to achieve this. Now, uh, you, you'll see now, uh, King George was about here. He wasn't total tyranny, he was about right here. And as the Founding Fathers tried to find, as they, they, 1776, they declared their independence, they tried to find people's law. They should have stopped there, they didn't. They went clear over to about here. And that's very close to what? Yeah, they're pretty close to anarchy, right. All right, so capital A there is 1776, as all of you know, and capital B is anarchy. And so the Articles of Confederation were very close to anarchy with no executive, no judiciary, no taxing power, no enforcement power. And it almost lost us the Revolutionary War, no doubt about it. All right, capital C. Washington was the major force in getting a Constitutional Convention in 1787. And the American ego finally came to rest after all those four months of great effort right here in the center of the political spectrum. I want to tell you that was ingenious. If you look up here on the screen, you'll see how we did it. Now, that was a, a people's law on the second strike. Now, of course, we were over here in the Articles of Confederation, and they moved it over here. A lot of people were afraid it would become too strong. Well, not unless it gets moved over here. Now, I want you to notice these lines. You see, these lines are all coming down here to the individual states. You see that? They don't go down here to the people. They're supposed to end at the states. And what's happening now, you know, they're all coming down a little further. But let's, let's uh, go further now. Did you get capital C, 1787, and capital D, the center? The center? All right. Now, the attack on the Constitution to pull us away from the center has been very real ever since about 1900. And everybody ought to realize that from over here, we have great forces now trying to pull our eagle off and away from where it belongs. And the, the most vigorous, vicious attack on our system has been uh, communism, which is a, its believers, its, its disciples have infiltrated almost every area of our government. It's amazing. And while I was in the FBI, I couldn't believe that our people were tolerating this. They said, well, it's just a different political ideology. It is not. It's a very destructive, subversive force designed to destroy everything we believe in. Are all our basic principles. So one is government. And then two, that's infiltration of the government. Number two, national socialism. And we've talked all about that, Nazism, over in Germany and in Italy, which is your blank. It was called fascism. And that's a system, of course, where they try to do it on a one country basis till they take over the world. And then democratic socialism, all of you know, has been also working in this area, trying to pull our eagle to the left. And it uses every emergency to say, oh, for the sake of the poor and for the sake of this and the sake of that, we've got to have more taxes, more laws, more regulations. So three is emergency. All right. Now, 
you should know that um, the Democrat, this whole cadre of collectivists, that's all I can call them because they, be they become from different branches, they first got control of the Supreme Court in 1936. And that's your blank. Now we have this beautiful Supreme Court and uh, lo and behold, they got control of it and five of them said, we're going to allow the Congress now to appropriate money for any good cause that they'd like to. Just destroyed limited government completely. And that was the famous Butler case. And uh, that, was a, that allowed big spending by the Congress from then on until now. And you're going to see the consequences as we go through our course. All right, and the next one. Then they captured a majority of the House of Representatives. Uh, some are Democrats, some Republicans, but uh, they were people who were collectivists, no matter what party they belonged to. And that's why we have to restore our institutes with Democrats and Republicans who are constitutionalists. And many of them have gone toward socialism in direct violation of their oath to uphold the Constitution, which is B. And I want you to hear a, a senator say it, if I can read it very briefly. He said, here's Senator Clark of Pennsylvania. We have inherited from our forefathers a governmental structure which so divides power that effective dealing with economic problems is cumbersome. Now he then goes on to say in that statement, which I'll let you read at your leisure, the fact that our legislatures are dangerous. And what we've got to do is to give more power, more power to the president, less power to, the, to your representatives. You see what that sounds like? Ruler's law. All right, there's Senator Clark. And then Senator Fulbright said the same thing, very similar. He said, the president is hobbled in his task of leading the American people to consensus and concerted action by the restrictions of power imposed on him by a constitutional system designed for the 18th century agrarian society far removed from the centers of world power. Well, I wanna tell you the founders anticipated our great age of world power and told us what to do. And so at your convenience, you can read that because it's, it's interesting to see how they felt about it. Well, the Democratic Socialists finally succeeded, you see, in pulling us clear over to the left until today, the federal government's coming clear down onto the local level in connection with um, almost every type of problem. So capital C, or little c rather, is left. Then D, they've invaded the rights of the private citizen as well as states' rights in all those areas that I pointed out to you. Now you see, this was the plan of the program that was so successful for 150 years, which is E. And now this, this change that's occurring is destroying many of the great things that belong to our Constitution. And it's important now that we sit down and become trained so that we can move back into that structure which is necessary, and that's our next lesson. We're gonna start talking about that, the basic beliefs of the Founding Fathers on which it was all structured.